Welcome to the Only Roofers Podcast. My name is Elizabeth and this is our co-host Vince. Today we have someone super special on, Mr. Jonathan Sherwood. Thank Welcome you. Welcome to the show. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for carving out some time. You know, I've been trying to connect with you for a while, but you're a busy lady. So I figured at this conference when I saw you, let's connect with her right away and get on her schedule so we can get some FaceTime and, and chat a little bit about what's going on in the yeah, industry. Yeah, yeah. So tell us a little bit about, I believe, Roofers Helping Roofers, Surefire, Seamless Systems. I can only tell from the branding. <laughs> really important, guys. Stay branded. So yeah. talk to us. Tell us a little bit about how you got started. Sure, absolutely. So uh, there's two brands that I'm affiliated with that, uh, as you just mentioned, one's going to be Surefire Seamless Systems. And basically what that was is I was already known in the industry for uh, contract procurement and fulfillment with other roofing contractors okay. and then doing a lot of the turnkey operations with them when it came to high pressure fluids, whether it was urethane, acrylic, foam, silicone, etc. Well, I was subcontracting that model out years ago. And when we ran into any type of warranty issues and stuff, I wanted to have the total control because my name was everything. So I did the one thing I said I was never going to do again after having a successful roofing company and sell it. I was like, I'll never own another roofing company. Now we have a national commercial fluid applied restoration roofing company so we can have total control over it that has a subcontracted model to a lot of the industry peers that we all know and then also retail and insurance as well. And then there's the Roofers Helping Roofers, which just kind of organically grew and was was born we never really planned it it just was a having a heart and passion for the industry getting a lot of guys uh, calling me asking me questions facetiming me on roofs uh, what product should I use how would you deal with this and then it came to a hashtag hashtag roofers helping roofers nice. and then before I knew it, a it yeah it was a brand it took a year and a half we got a trademark and now we fly all over the United States and do roofs for their contractors and then we have the consulting platform aspect of it where you know they'll get a full day quick start a file vault that they have access to to access to me for the year, help them sell the jobs, do the jobs we need to be, connect them with manufacturers and applicators in their specific uh, target markets, and just been rocking and rolling from there. Amazing. So yeah. you said earlier you got into something that you said you'd never do again. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Why'd you do that? So a little bit of backstory to make you, it all you kind jumped of off the hit, You jumped off it, sold it, and then jumped yeah. back off. Yeah. So I've been in roofing for almost 15 years now, and I originally started a roofing, a roofing company called G2 Roofing and Construction. G2? Uh, that, yep, G2. What's a G2 about? So my I'm a G, but yeah, are you so, G2? Uh, so my, <laughs> my partner's name was Greg Marthaler Jr., uh, so it was Greg the second, so G2. So we had named it after him. The logo looked real cool that he came up with. Well, we had that business for quite some time. We branded it. It was predominantly residential, right. and it had maybe 10 to 15% of commercial to oh, it. Wow, and funny. then when I started traveling, doing a lot of commercial, yeah, when I started traveling, doing a lot of commercial, I was like, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sell this. We ended up selling it to the regional operations manager of John Mansville. Oh, wow. So he bought it for his sons, Robert Marshall. He DBA'd it at Marshall Brothers LLC. Wow. And I was already in Texas and flying around kind of as a gun for hire. So I told myself, man, this is easier. I have no liability. Gun I'm selling. Hire, yeah. And then you have the gun on the yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm selling I'm under. selling big roofs. Not a lot of liability. This is great. Just kind of. This is perfect. Yeah. I was just like a glorified broker. You know, right. that's just call it what it is. And then I needed the total control and I did the one thing I said I wasn't going to do again and that was take on assume all the liability and, and take on everything. Is that because you knew you can do it right and you were having problems with it? I wasn't necessarily having problems with it but when I had started out I was my brand. Right. So let's look at it like okay let's look at uh, an average roofing of company maybe they have you know a CEO some management some salespeople right. office staff if you get a negative Google review you apply yeah. the Google review you make it right. Well yeah. people working with directly with me so if there was any error there was no anything. They're you. Yeah, they're they're viewing me completely. So I wanted total control. Nothing really had happened. Right. But we were doing so much volume, and we were quantifying Just millions of square of footage. It was a matter of time. We needed to control everything. Plus, we need the buying power to go direct to the manufacturer and distribution in some cases to buy it at such a low price point that we could stay aggressive. Because here's the thing: if you're working with other roofing contractors. I had to leave the meat on the bone for the contractor or the yeah. roofers helping roofers niche made no sense. Yeah. So it was to have the control to make it make sense because we make the least amount on the job, but again, we quantify right. millions of square footage. Let's talk really quickly um, because there's a lot of contractors who currently use subs. Mm -hmm. There's a lot in the industry that's happening right now where some people are wanting to start bringing their subs in-house. Other people are growing their subdivisions or adding more sub subdivisions. What are some of the main issues that happen when you do have subs, like a quality control perspective so here's the thing that I've seen in my tenure in the roofing industry right yeah okay any 
roofing contractor or owner of a roofing company that tells you they do not ever use subcontractors is probably not being very transparent and rigorously honest because a lot of them use insurance and storms. So they're not really sized and ready to have that much in-house installation or yeah. application staff, so they have to go to subs. Yeah. Here's the thing about subs. We like to tell them what time to be at the job site, yeah. when they're gonna leave, yeah. hey, act as if you work for us, wear our shirt, do this. That's treating them as an employee. Right. If something negative or adverse were to happen, you would yeah. get the ramifications of treating a subcontractor as an employee when they're not a real employee. Yeah. So that's one of the big things that I think you know, a lot of people dodge the bullet on, but when right. you start getting a lot larger and you're doing thousands of POs, a it's a lot harder to dodge that bullet. That was one thing we did, and all of our staff is W-2. Yeah. All of our staff is W-2, which was a huge thing. A lot of out, a lot of outgoing resources in the yeah. beginning, but right. again, we get back to that protection. A lot of people won't talk about that unless you've tasted liability. Mm -hmm. I've tasted liability in 15 years. I don't want to taste liability again. So I'd rather spend the money up front and do it right. Uncle Sam's not fun. Yeah, Uncle Sam's not fun or having issues aren't fun, so do it right. But I would say that's one of the biggest things is they will have subcontractors, then they treat them as an employee. And then here's the other thing. Okay, your subcontractor honors that war that warranty. You're, you're out chasing storms across the nation. What happens when there's a warranty to service and that crew's somewhere else, long yeah. gone in the United States? Right. You're having somebody go out there or call and you're at the mercy of somebody local to try to fix that for you. So you don't have the control. You're treating people's employees that aren't employees. If you allow them to have your phones, drive your cars, put magnets on it, it could be legal ramification down the road. So I just, you know, try to do mm -hmm. it right. And the thing is for me, I just made so many mistakes that I, Made myself successful in the end because I paid all the dumb tax and figured it all out on the on the way. That brings me to my other question, which would be, so now as being uh, now having all your crews in house, having having everything coming in, how do you manage all of these W two employees? What is now going bringing the crews in house? You have multiple crews, you have multiple jobs. Um, that's part of my question is going to be the workmanship warranty, right? Yeah. Because what you said is most contractors actually do not sell workmanship warranties or they do the minimum available by the state. So yeah. with your systems, are you doing uh, workmanship warranties? And if so, how are you preparing yourself? Such a spread. Okay, so two part question. So the first part like is, that yeah, so like, no, it's a great, it's a really good question because you're drawing things out that if I was listening, I would want to hear about. Yeah. yeah. So I have a really good team. So yeah. I'm super blessed. I have a gentleman that's our GM or quality control manager who hires all of the all the labor, and that's all he oversees is labor and logistics and taking good care of them, making sure they have their vacation time for the lot amount of time that they work, making sure they have their hours set, making sure they're on the job. He runs all that so it goes very smooth. Without him, I would fall apart. Yeah. That's the reality. Without him, I would fall apart. And then second part of the question was? Um, with the workmanship warranty. Workmanship warranty. Yeah. So we offer a couple of different warranties at Surefire Seamless Systems. We offer the manufacturer-backed material labor warranties, which are going to be dictated completely by pre and post job surveys by the manufacturer and the manufacturer's specification on you know when it comes to fluid how much fluid you put down right. is how long of a duration of warranty 10 15 or 20 years so we offer those which manufacturer you know if they're going to hold the bag on it yeah. they're going to be real hard on the specification yeah, and they're trying to sure. put bulletproof roofs on oh, so sure. it's they're much higher cost roof but they tend less likely to fail then we have our in-house warranties which we offer a 10-year warranty and it's going to be covering basically leak proof, meaning the craftsmanship. If there was a product failure, we'll go to the manufacturer right, sure. for it, but we're gonna go ahead and take care of all the craftsmanship. So let's just be real about it. When a roof fails, because you can't do yeah, millions of square yeah, feet and exactly. say it's not gonna fail, because then you're just, again, not being rigorously honest you about what you're doing. Yeah. So when it fails, what we do is we bird dog it, find out what's going on, and try to fix it immediately. And the reason why I like the closed cell foam that you always hear me talk about is because it's a closed cell product. It doesn't allow content damage beneath the roof line. Okay. So all the damage tends to stay top side. But if we use products that do allow it to go all the way through to the substrate or even into the, below the roof line interior right. of the building, we just try to get out there quick and pony up and you know do what a good business do owners do and that's take care of any damage that we made and move on to the next. Keeping the client happy because here's the reality of it. Shit happens, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's, let's, 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 let's look at it like this. Yeah. When people read books about people, we never read books about people that are alive. We read books about people that are dead, because it's all about how you finish. If you go in there and you do have something happen, but you make it something where it's not uncomfortable for that client, yeah. you're excited about it, you're still servicing your warranty, you're still running your business, you get it fixed real quick, you're still doing the radio fan culture and they're still gonna call you for the next yeah. project. No, it's how sure. quick you respond. 100%. Get, going back a little bit to the sub part, right? Is, subs is a huge part of this industry, obviously. And I, going on what you're saying, bringing it all in-house, it's a big nut to swallow in the beginning, yeah. right? And, and 
and I think that's sort of the question really is, is it because people are just scared to really, they, don't, they, they want to take on so much work, so they don't want to, they, they see the nut of what yeah. a W-2 would be, and now it's like, it's more of like it, their own integrity of, okay, but I can take on more business, instead of being a great business and I can scale slowly Correct. or whoever it is, yeah. and be on W-2. I think it comes down to a few different things. The weight of it. Yeah. The uncomfortable feeling right. of it. Because now you're responsible, you're technically really responsible for other people's livelihoods. Correct. The cost of it. Yeah. Are you vetted yourself to actually have that cost? Yeah, because you have W-2, you have to pay the employee, but you also have yeah. to pay employer taxes. Yeah, you got to pay all the taxes. Yeah. You got to pay all the taxes on so it. You got to have your work miss have comp. All yeah, yeah, so it's cost. It's, 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 <laughs> being able, it's being able to carry that weight and it's getting out of the fear factor on it. Because here's the thing, most people like to do the subcontracting model because it's gonna be like more cost effective yeah. Yeah, exactly. on their thing. You have an employee and the year starts to get bad, you're in a situation where you have to let somebody go. Yeah. It's not like calling a sub and say, we don't have any work, go yeah. work for my, the right. next guy. It's, it's like, fun now you have now. somebody and if you care about your staff, which I'm sure all of us do Everyone here, yeah. you're thinking yeah. about, okay, they got children at home, they got these yeah. things going on and those are the uncomfortable con I tell my employees all the time, I work for you. You don't, you don't work for me. Yeah. So I think a cost is a huge, huge part of it. Cost is going to be probably the huge part, and then the uncomfortable weight of it. Because it definitely is a little bit different feeling when they're employees versus subcontractors. Do you think it's an accepted norm also? Meaning like keeping up with the Joneses, that's what jo John the roofer does, so Paul the roofer does the same thing, just sub, 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 instead of just creating a, a, a standard of, of, of not? I feel that it was, it was the accepted norm for a really long time, right. but I feel like people are going more to like the employees, even as chips, the office staff, a few of the managers. But the thing that I've noticed is the real sustainable, large kind of titans in our industry are a mixture of both. Yeah. They're a mixture of both. They have a lot of employees, office staff, right. managers, Admin. things of that nature. And then when it comes to the Project install, management. yeah, yeah. When it comes to sales guys sometimes, and they'll give them draws and different things like that, depending on how they're structured. But then when it comes to the installation or application process, they, they tend to be subcontractors. Right. Yeah. So they can have some that way they don't have the weight when it slows down. Right, they have scalability, but they the have. The first thing that cuts the labor. Right. Which, if you think about it, in a roofing company, the two biggest costs they have is labor and materials. Yeah. So one really important thing, we talk a lot about, everybody talks about scalability, scaling, grow this, grow that, but there actually has to be a scale. Like there has to be a scale set up to be able to have a successful scale, scaling the company, right? Because if you scale something that does not have a set scale, that means systems, process, procedures to have, let's say for a uh, uh, labor crew, a good infrastructure, right? So what does a good labor crew look like? If I'm gonna go hire a sub, what should I tell them? What kind of team do I want? Let's say I'm looking for an install team or myself, I wanna create an install team. What does that structure look like? So I'm gonna try to make it kind of residential specific just yeah. because yeah. This, be con this, this conference right. is got a lot of guys doing residential and yeah. that's that's where everybody starts, right? Yeah. right? You don't hear anybody say, yeah, I just do 10 million in commercial and I've never done a house before. So right. let's talk about where everybody starts so it can be a little yeah. more helpful. Yeah. So when you're going for, in my professional opinion, yeah a install crew that you're gonna W-2, what I like to do with them is you wanna get between four and six guys and you wanna put them on your hardest roofs, meaning more stories, steeper, more layers. Why is that? When you're subcontracting work, they get paid additional charges gotcha. for all that is additional, whether it's steeper, whether it's bad access, whether it's multiple layers. When you have an in-house crew, they're paid a set fee all year long. Have them do your more expensive roofs the and then sub cheaper. all the easy roofs out that are gonna have the lower price point to kind of off balance the out-of-pocket expense that you're paying for having not, the insurance. So it's scary. Doesn't look so scary too. Plus, here's the reality of it. If they get hurt and they're really employees, you got workers' comp, things are in place. Yeah. If the subcontractor gets hurt... Workers' comp is extremely important. If you don't have it set up, there's just a yeah. pause for that. Yeah, so here's the thing. If you do a subcontractor and he gets hurt, you're at the mercy of the relationship. Either you're paying some doctor bills, or he can go say, hey, they were treating me like an employee. I fell off this roof and broke my ribs, and you still yeah. become liable so for it. So now you're liable for the medical bills, you're still, and, you have the, and you get sued. And, you have Uncle Sam, and there's, and there's councils that specialize and are predatory yeah. off of that type of stuff. 100%. All the unions. So you got to protect yourself. Yeah, no, you know? Any last pieces of advice of someone who, for the most part, let's say they're looking, we're just talking about really labor, because that's one I really mm -hmm. want to address with you, because that's what you're specializing in. When it comes to their labor, any final advice? What do you think what, as coming into the industry on so many different areas, going from roofer, going to sub, going to roofer again, like what is the... Probably a little bit different than what folks are, are used to hearing. Again, this is just my professional opinion. 
Professional lot, if I need to hear, folks. Yeah, the, the disclaimer. <laughs> so, a lot of times what we see, and I've been guilty of this maybe over a decade ago, you got your office staff, you got your sales staff. We're right. going to start there for a second. Right? I know you asked about labor, we're going to roll into that. Your office staff sitting there thinking, man, if it wasn't for me, these guys wouldn't even be able to get their roofs put on because I'm taking care of the insurance paperwork, taking care of the payroll, getting all this taken care of. Your sales guys, narcissistic, brash individuals, some of them are saying, none of y'all would even have a job yeah. if it wasn't for me selling these roofs so we could get on so we, keep, teams. so we could keep the thing. Now we cultivate where everybody loves one another and it's kind of a win. But what we left out was that labor. A lot of times the office staff and the sales staff don't ever even think about the labor. You got the office staff saying that the sales staff and the company couldn't run without them, which is correct. You got the sales staff saying that no, they wouldn't even have a job if they weren't selling deals. If we weren't putting the roofs on, nobody would ever get paid. Right. Yeah. Nobody would ever get paid. But nobody, nobody gives the labor that thought. So yeah. here's what I've learned about labor. A lot of times in this industry, the labor is Hispanic labor, right? And there's some language barriers sometimes, unless you're hiring bilingual individuals. What we started doing is having Christmas parties for our subcontracted labor and in-house labor, and individually doing stuff, appreciate them. And let them know they're that they're appreciated. Too. And Summer as soon nine. as you cultivate the relationship where you know, where you make them feel like you want them to win too, and they're a part of the organization, you will entirely change how your business is ran. And, that, and that's sub or not. Yep, sub or not. So what I'll do is I'll have two Christmas parties sometime, because here's the other thing. Sometimes it might make the labor crews feel a little uncomfortable to come to your yeah, company Chris party. Nobody's really talking to them. They don't really know. Them. So I'll either do one all together or I'll do two separate ones. And I'll cater to what I think that is that, that they like. And when they feel that you want them to win, sub or not, or even employee, yeah. it's completely different. Yeah. It's completely different because they feel like they matter. And when they feel like they matter, they work better for and you. You're also separating yourself from the other competition, right? They're doing labor for other roofers, yep. right? And, so and then who I do you think pops up first if they get all these different exactly. things? Who they want to work for? The other thing is, when your labor wants you to weed and, or win and succeed, it just everything else comes together. Yeah. You don't have to worry about how I'm scaling, how I'm making it happen. Everything just starts to come together for you. So it's not it's all about cool. the money also. Yep, 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 you know? I think one of the biggest things that I've seen is that people don't really share, the owner never shares their vision with the crew, never shares their vision with their employee. So there's a strong disconnect even between the owner to the rest of the team. So I think that should be everyone's really end of year focus is writing down what their vision is so that they can align themselves of how they want to treat everyone on their team. So yeah. definitely appreciate you being on the oh, yeah. podcast, Thanks Jonathan. On, Thank appreciate you so it, much. Thank you, yeah. Thank Thank you guys. Thank, Thank you, appreciate you so much guys. for watching another episode of the Only Roofers podcast. Check us out on the links below.